Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I don't need the egg no, shaker. No, thanks. Now, you don't want me to have the egg shakers. More like it. So, I don't want to get out of control with that thing. I, <clears throat> the last Sunday, I uh, had some tightness in my back, and then we were moving a desk because, you know, we're trying to set up schooling's station at, at home, right, for Rosie. And I did the uh, dumb move of, you know how you're supposed to use your legs when you move things and everything? I did this. That was a bad decision. And so something happened back here, like in the rib cage area. I don't know, but it's still bothering me. So anyways, uh, forgive me if I don't seem as animated and wave my arms around nearly as much as you're accustomed to, <laughs> but uh, it is what it is. So I don't want the egg shaker is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> All that to say, I don't need the egg shaker. So um, today is gonna be our third and final day in our mission series before we get back to Core 52 next Sunday. And if you've been with us for a while, you know our mission statement, and it is... I don't know if you can tell with the mask on, but this is a face of disappointment and the lack of enthusiasm. I, I mean, uh, maybe some of you were just a little apprehensive. Look, I'll just let you know clearly up, up front, because I know some are, are fairly new to the church here, but our mission statement as a church is to love God, love people, make disciples, all right? So let's try that again. Our mission as a church is to love God, love people, make disciples. All right, now we are awake and ready to rock and roll. Uh, this is not a fancy mission statement by any means, but it is what Jesus told us to be about. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting this week as we we're preparing for this. Corey sent me a sermon from a guy named Matt Chandler. He's a preacher down at this sizable church in the Texas area. Well, Texas is a large area down in Texas uh, called the Village Church. And they had recently gone through the process of simplifying their mission statement as a church from a big fancy catchword to make or to love God, love people and make disciples. Imagine that. And I'm like copycats. No, I'm kidding. It's, it's what Jesus told us to be about. It's the great commandment and the great commission. And so we've spent the last two weeks talking about the first two parts, the love God. We went all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter six, because when Jesus is asked about what the greatest commandments are, it's that teaching that comes up. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Second is love your neighbor as yourself. So love God, love people. We spent some time last week talking about loving people that, you know, we have been set free in Christ to love and serve other people. So more than just concerning ourselves with the target of our love and affection and service as Christians, you need to understand baseline that the freedom you have in Christ is not so that you can do whatever you want, which is kind of a funny way to talk about freedom, because most of the time when we as just Americans talk about freedom, it's this liberty to do whatever we want. <laughs> but as Christ or in Christ, we are free to love and serve other people. He's not just our Savior. He's our Lord. There's no separation of those two things. And if you go around claiming that Jesus is your Savior and not your Lord, you don't have a biblical concept of who Jesus is. Because to say that He's only Savior and not Lord is heresy to, to biblical text. In the Bible, He's always Lord. And so we need to be conscious of that. Now we get into make disciples. And normally we spend some time in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. And we will not be doing that today. <laughs> We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3 of all places. Because one of the things we've tried to do through this series is more than just focus on the target of who we love and how we make disciples and all those sorts of things. We kind of want to get a little more foundational in our understanding of these things so that we're better able to fulfill this mission that Christ has given to every Christian who is a part of the church. So we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to talk about discipleship and what it is and what it looks like. Before we concern ourselves too greatly with going and making disciples, we need to understand, am I engaging in the discipleship? 
as a person. So let me go ahead and say a word of prayer, and we'll get into it all. Father, we thank you so much for today, and we thank you for the time that you've given us to be here together. We thank you that there are kids downstairs today, and that they're here worshiping. I just pray that that goes well for them, learning and worshiping and being together. Lord, just thank you so much that we could get something together for the kids downstairs. And Father, I just pray for all the kids here in this room that you would help us to have childlike faith, that you would help us to have a childlike heart and just receive what your Holy Spirit is saying to us today. Help us to examine our own lives, Lord, to figure out where we are in our relationship with you and how we can continue to grow. Uh, because as disciples, we are in a constant state of growth. So, Father, help us to engage actively, intentionally in our own growth and Christ-likeness today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Like I mentioned before, we, we historically will go to Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 through 20, because that is the, the Great Commission. It's a great passage. I love it, and I love it for a couple of reasons. One, right off the bat, you know, it's like you have Jesus appears to them on this mountain, on this hillside, and they see him. And I love the note that says some worshiped, but some doubted. I, I think that's really great that Scripture includes that because I, I do think you can worship and doubt at the same time. I, I think just because you have some doubt doesn't mean you are lost. I think God provides room for us to doubt. And I say that because right after it says, and they worshiped Him, but some doubted, it says, and Jesus came to them and said. He didn't argue with them. He didn't make them feel terrible for their doubt, right? He came to them. And, and told them the Great Commission. I think that's really powerful that Matthew would include that in his second of two Emmanuel bookmarks to his gospel. And so Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I mean, all authority. I mean, Jesus is the authority of the cosmos. John chapter 1, right? The Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And by Him and through Him, all things were created. I mean, that's pretty... He has all authority, is, is Christ. And He says, Therefore, go, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you with you, and I am with you always to the very end of the age. Great passage. And in that passage, the commandment is to make disciples. It's not go, it's make disciples. And the idea is, as you go about doing your life, help other people become disciples. And so we spend some time talking about what does it mean to even be a disciple? What is a disciple? And you go all the way back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, and you've got Jesus calling people to follow Him, and He says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And I love that story, you know, he's calling Peter, and they're all fishing, Peter and John, and they don't have anything in their nets, right? And Jesus shows up, they're not even good at their job, <laughs> you know? And I love this because when Jesus is calling his 12 disciples, not a one of them are, are rock stars, not a one of them are first team all league, you know what I mean? Like, not a one of them are the type, the cream of the crop, really, they're just regular old folks who are mediocre at what they do in life. I love that. Because it gives me hope that, hey, Jesus is calling me to the team as well. Because there's a lot of times where I feel pretty mediocre in life. You know, I'm not trying to talk down about myself, but let's just be real. So I love that. The fisherman thing, like a lot of us jive with that whole illustration. I mean, that's a very big part of our culture around here, fishing and everything. But follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's kind of a bizarre thing, Jesus. But to help bring people into the kingdom to become followers, to become disciples of Jesus. We've talked about disciple before and this idea of rabbi and student, that a student would follow a rabbi like a lot, spend days with him, years with him, every single day, hearing the rabbi's words, watching the rabbi's action with the whole intention of knowing what the rabbi knows, learning what the rabbi does so that the student can become like the rabbi. And that is a real picture of, of being a disciple, of becoming someone who is like Christ. So before we really dig into uh, Philippians and why I wanted to spend some time here this morning, 
We need to talk about what discipleship is. Because before we go out there and make disciples and, and help bring people into the kingdom of God and a part of this family we call the church, we need to figure out what, what does discipleship look like for us on a regular basis and have a, a little bit more of an understanding about that. You know, being what is a, a disciple? It's a learner, follower of Jesus. And discipleship, and here's the big thing for today, discipleship is the life of pursuing Christ and becoming like Him. Discipleship is a life of pursuing Christ and becoming like Him. Right off the bat, there's a couple things we need to know that discipleship is not, for sure. One, it is not a book, a class, or a lecture. It's not a program. Uh, as a pastor, you get weird questions from other pastors all the time because some people are just real church nerds, you know, and they want to know all kinds of intricacies of how church operates and what you do there, there, and the other thing. And so one common question you get from pastors all the time like at church conferences, is what does your church do for discipleship? And that's a challenging question, you know, because for a lot of us, for a long period of time, the church in the United States, Western church, discipleship has been a program. Like here's this thing you come and attend at this certain time and place, and you'll become a disciple. And that can be beneficial. There can be good things that come out of lectures. There can be good things that come out of classes. There can be good things that come out of, well, gathering together at a time and place to hear someone talk. <laughs> you know, There's value in that, but that's not the whole sum of discipleship. It's not just a program. It's not just something we do. It's more like everything we do as a church. In fact, I would take it a step further than that. It's who we are. So it's, it's not just a program that we just kick off come, you know, the beginning of the year and we get all plugged into these groups and these classes and we're going to be disciples. It's, it's more than that. It's, it's who you are. And the other thing is, it's not fast. Discipleship is not fast. It is the life of pursuing Christ and becoming like Him. It is slow. And that is antithetical to our culture in our world today where we can find out what's happening in India two seconds after it happens. We can Facebook live something on the entire opposite side of the globe. If something happens in Greenland, we can find out about it. In fact, I have a friend who's in the Coast Guard who's been touring Greenland recently. That's why it's in my mind that I can see what Greenland looks like live. It's pretty crazy. We're in a culture where everything is microwaved and happens quickly. We want instantaneous results. And when something doesn't happen quickly, we give up on it easily. We give up on it easily. Discipleship is a lifelong journey. Discipleship is a life of pursuing Christ and becoming like Him. And Paul realized this when he wrote the book of Philippians. Now, the church in Philippi, they got a variety of things going on. Chapter 3 is a great chapter. Verses 1 through 11 are particularly powerful. Our bulk of focus is going to be in 12 through 21 today. But in chapter 3, 1 through 11, just to give you a little context of what he's talking about, you know, he's, he's kind of addressing legalism self-righteousness, the things that I can do that make me special or earn some reward from God. I do these things. I'm awesome and God owes me good things. And he's saying, look, I've got the resume of righteousness to get myself into heaven. I've, I'm from this people group. I've done these things, blah, 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 blah. He's like, I am the first league all team. I am the, the rock star and the, the A-plus student in the honor society. I am employee of the year. I am all of these things. And you know what he says? Crumple that up, throw it in the garbage. It's worth fill in the blank with a word we shouldn't say out loud in church. I mean, that's how strongly the Greek language is for Paul. I mean, I'm not just trying to like emphasize, he emphasized that word in such strong fashion that I might get in trouble if I, the preacher, said it out loud at church. It's that kind of emphasis. He's like, that's, that's nothing. It is absolute garbage compared to knowing Christ. And it's just this wonderful picture, like to Paul, 
Nothing matters more in this world than knowing Christ and being found in Him and knowing His resurrection. In fact, you get to the end of that paragraph and he says, verse 8, Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. There's the word. Rubbish is put in it lightly. In order that I might gain Christ. He has had a radical change of life. He was in the fast lane for success, wealth, and fame in his world. And he abandoned it all because Christ showed up in his life and changed his heart and his mind and changed him. And so he's like, I'll give that all up. It's all garbage in order that I might gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that comes, from, comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and may share in His sufferings, and listen to this part, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible, I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. So Paul has this vision of what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a Christian, to know Christ, to know Him more, to know Him more intimately, to become like Him, even in His sufferings. Even in His sufferings. I don't need to spend a lot of time on that because, <laughs> I don't know, we... <laughs> That just always gets us off track on our thinking when we carry about that. But we generally don't suffer much here in this country for the sake of Christ. Not saying that there isn't any form of suffering, but not to the level that Paul experienced. And every bit and ounce of suffering that he endured, he celebrated that Christ would count him worthy of suffering in that way because of his love for and association with Christ Jesus. And a lot of us, if we're being honest with ourselves, when hardship comes or criticism comes, we quickly shy away in order to avoid critique, let alone suffering. He wants to be like Christ, even if it means sharing the sufferings. So, where that comes and focuses in for us is this discipleship is not something that we just obtain one day. It's not like you get baptized and then, bam, you've arrived. You know, for the large part, the majority of churches, and I'm speaking very general terms here, and we've even struggled with this a bit here if we're being real about it is it seems like our mission in the Make Disciples is relegated to let's dunk them. Let's get to the converted part. Conversion doesn't necessarily equal lifelong disciple. It's a moment and a decision, but discipleship is a life. It's a life pursuit of Christ and becoming like Him. You don't have to do any work. You don't have to labor to get grace, to be forgiven, to be saved. But after the fact, and this is what Paul has to say, not that I have already, this is chapter 3, verse 12 of Philippians, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Thank you, Lord, for putting this verse in here. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Christ already did what was required to save you and forgive you and to bring you into His family, to adopt you as a child, to make you His own. You're saved. You're forgiven. You don't have to worry about that part. Okay? So, just hold on to that good truth. Okay? But Paul's like, I have not obtained this level of knowing Christ. 
And for Paul at this point in his life to say these things is powerful. He's been a Christian for a fair amount of time. He's done incredible things for the sake of the kingdom. He's started multiple churches. He's endured sufferings for the sake of Christ. I would say that Paul has obtained quite the level of discipleship and maturity in Christ Jesus that I could only hope for, that I'm still striving for. And I love the fact that someone in this level says, not that I have already obtained it. And I think that's real key to being a disciple of Jesus, that ongoing humility. That never feeling like you've arrived somewhere or have accomplished much, but you always have room to grow in Christ. And as you grow more and more in Christ, your humility should increase. Your sense of accomplishment should decrease. Because it's not about what you've accomplished, it's about what Christ has accomplished. And apart from Him, we are nothing. Not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Very much athletic terms here. Sorry for people who aren't into athletics. I was barely into athletics. I participated, I'll just put it that way. <laughs> but this press on, this kind of marathon kind of picture, this race, we get a lot of this around baccalaureate time for high school ceremonies, of course, real cliche. But that really is a lot of this imagery that, that Paul uses here. I press on, I strive, I labor, I endure, I fight, I run one foot in front of the other to make this Christ likeness, this knowledge of Christ my own. But one thing I do, or excuse me, verse 13, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Again, here's this athletic imagery, right? I forget what lies behind. Okay, so he's got this clear vision of, of discipleship and what it means to be a follower, student learner of Jesus Christ lifelong. It's like, this is not something I've obtained. I'm looking forward and I'm forgetting what lies behind. I'm not arguing with Paul here, but I do think on occasion it is a decent thing for you to remember the fact that you're a sinner. And I say that because when we understand the depth of our sin, we more fully are aware of the magnitude of God's grace and how powerful it is. And how deep and powerful His grace is. When we really understand our sinfulness, the grace of Jesus on the cross is rich. It's not cheap. And it impacts every fiber of our being. So, but, forgetting what lies behind, don't hang out there and don't use it as your excuse to move forward and become more like Christ. A lot of people use things in their past as their excuses for their continued addiction and behaviors. They're continuing to choose sinful nature or indulge the flesh like we talked about last week. Christ forgave you of those things and He gave you victory over those things. Do you believe that to be true or not? And if you do believe that to be true, if you believe that what Christ accomplished is actually powerful enough to forgive you of your sin and to raise you from the grave to resurrect your body someday in the future, then He's powerful enough to forgive you of your sins and break your chains. And you don't have to live in bondage to those things anymore. You can leave them in the past where they belong. Yeah, it's decent to have a little scrapbook to say, wow, look at what Christ has done in my life. But it's also meant to be like, I am not that person anymore. Though I'm not perfect, though I haven't obtained it, humbly I strive forward. I press on. Uh, it's, it's a race that everybody wins. And I don't like participation trophies, but in this case, thank you, Jesus, that that's what this is. Because let's be real. Sometimes this race is like a nice you know, I don't know if any of you have really been into running before. I was briefly for a period of my time, all right? And not just to the buffet line. <laughs> I, I ran this thing called Ragnar Relay. It's like hood to coast. And, 
when you're a bigger guy, you really got to work on mechanics so you don't like break yourself after one mile. And like I remember at one point I'm running my first leg of this ultra relay. It was a 13.2 mile leg, first of three. I wouldn't believe that if I wasn't the one who ran it. So I don't, I understand your skepticism here, okay? But I remember getting to a point where it was just like this stride and your body was on autopilot, you know? And it's just like, you got the breathing, you got your footwork down, you're, you're landing right where you should. And it's just, you're just cruising. You're just cruising. You broke through that initial pain and discomfort and it's before the, the real wall bonks at the end and you're just kind of in this cruise autopilot. Sometimes life as a disciple feels like that. You're just cruising along. Other times it feels like you got jumped in the alleyway and it's everything you have to crawl forward. But just keep pressing on, straining forward to this upward call of life, pursuing Christ and becoming like Him. This is a journey. This is a long process. This is not something that happens overnight. It is a life of doing this. Now, one thing through all this coronavirus and everything, uh, we have, as a leadership here at the church, really spent some time the last several months talking about this. Like, how are we helping people become disciples and trying to work on that this is not a program that we start come the beginning of 2021 and you all sign up for this and here it is because that stuff comes and goes. And to be quite honest, the COVID shutdowns have really kind of, in my heart at least, painted this picture or this reality that, hey, if we're relying on people showing up to something, that can be taken away. So what do we do? <laughs> Can we, can we work on discipleship apart from gathering together for Sunday morning service? I sure hope so, because there's a lot of people that aren't here still. You know, and if we got shut down ever again for some reason, the next pandemic, a tsunami, <laughs> are we capable of still growing? So it, it's a culture. It's a culture that has to be built, and, and every individual becoming intentional, kind of realizing where they're at in the process and having the, the vision to grow and to move forward. So one of the things we've done, just kind of to pause the scripture here, to give a little bit of a, a practical bit of this life pursuing Christ and having a vision in the future of growing and being intentional is we've kind of identified this pathway that you, you step on and you start growing toward a mature believer in Jesus Christ. And... So we have these kind of categories, right? And I just want to read these out to you, things that our leadership has come up with as we've brainstormed this. And I want you to listen pretty carefully. I'm going to talk about traits and indicators of someone kind of in this, on this part of the journey here uh, to becoming a mature disciple-making disciple. Maybe you can identify where you're at. I'm not going to identify you for you, but maybe you can like, figure out where you're at. Don't be discouraged by that if that's the case. Just realize, hey, I can do some things to keep growing, okay? We got to be intentional about this straining forward, pressing forward toward the goal. We can't just show up and expect this stuff to happen. I really think that's kind of the heart of what Paul's trying to say here. I press on, I strain forward, I, I move toward the upward call in Christ Jesus. I don't just sit here because you see, Simply being associated with Christ does not mean you're going to grow in Christ. you got to be in pursuit of Him, of knowing Him and becoming like Him and abiding in Him. So anyways, the very first thing is pretty obvious is a pre-faith. The person in the pre-faith, before they believe in Jesus and accept Him as Lord and Savior and are baptized and, and ask for forgiveness and those sorts of things, in the pre-faith, somebody in the pre-faith category is probably very curious about, maybe they're curious, maybe they're not, but there's some openness to the gospel. Uh, they're very much self-focused or man-focused, not really God-focused. God doesn't dictate their worldview or how they do things in life. They lack a general knowledge of Jesus, probably indifferent to sin. Oh yeah, I mean, I do that, no big deal, sort of a thing. Honestly... Sometimes that is true for people who've been in church for 20 years. Like we negotiate deals with God. 
You can be the Lord of this aspect of my life, but not that aspect of my life. That's not how it works, by the way. Maybe there's just kind of a, a searching lack of satisfaction in their life. And some of the key needs to help that person move from pre-faith into the next category is relationships with Christians. It's one thing to have a relationship with people that don't believe in Jesus, but how are you being intentional about showing Jesus to people? This is a real key to evangelism, to helping people step in (laughs) to this life and this family and becoming disciples of Jesus is for us as Christians to to have relationships with people that don't believe like we do, that don't have faith like we do, but not just to hang out, to also provide opportunities to share the gospel, to share our faith, and to invite them on the journey with us. So relationships with Christians, they, they need to be welcomed as they are. So anytime someone who's new comes to the church, like we, we need to be the most hospitable and welcoming church there is because God welcomed you, right? No offense to you. <laughs> God welcomed me. And I'm, I am a sinner, I've been to rehab for sin, all right? Like, I am a sinner, and God has welcomed me in graciously to His family and into His church. And so we need to make sure, and I'm not saying we're not, but we need to really make sure that we're being intentional of inviting people in, making them feel welcomed. They need to hear the gospel. They need to experience the love of Jesus. And here's kind of what I was talking about just a second ago with the relationship with Christians. They need to see the tangible benefit of being a Christian. There is benefit in life right now to being a Christian. Are you demonstrating that? Or are you just another person in their life who does something on Sunday mornings that they don't do? I hope and pray that your relationship with Jesus is more than church attendance. And that your relationship with Jesus dictates how you live life. And as you go about living your life, because you're only here for an hour and ten minutes a week if you come on a regular basis. I hope and pray that your life with Jesus is evident. And people, they see your life. They see how you've handled the pandemic. They see how you've handled politics. They see how you've handled natural disasters. They see how you've raised your family. They see how you work at your job. They see these things about your life, and they see Christ in you. Is there something tangible that's a benefit as a Christian? Okay, So that's the pre-faith. That's what they need, and that's kind of who they are. And then someone who's converted just comes in and becomes a Christian. That new faith category, they oftentimes lack a depth of knowledge of the Bible and of faith. But there's an excitement about them. There's an excitement in their new faith. But it's still very much inward focus. How do I grow? How do I stop sinning? How do I do this? How do I become more like Jesus? There's a desire to grow. So some of the key needs they have is mentoring relationships with mature believers. And this is a big aspect of discipleship. And we'll get to that here in a second in the passage. But they really need people to come alongside them and and invite them on the journey. To grab them by the hand, not tell them what to do or beat them over the head, but to grab them by the hand and say, come with me, let's do this thing together. Very important. They need to learn foundational Bible truths and they need encouragement. So... Maybe some of you here are in this category where you don't really know a lot about the Bible or faith. You have a desire to grow. You're still really concerned about how do I live my daily life as a Christian? And this is some of those things that you need or some mentoring relationships and everything. So just think about that. Pray about that. We get into the next category on this journey of of discipleship and growing in our Christ-likeness is a young faith. And these, these people are developing more relationships with believers. They're learning about spiritual disciplines and those are becoming more common. So Bible reading, prayer, giving, serving, fasting, things of that nature. Some of those disciplines are becoming more rare, or more common, excuse me. Uh, They start to share their faith. 
They start to share their faith and kind of vocalize, not just live out, but vocalize their faith in Jesus. They're making life changes that are based on faith in Christ. This is where we start going from like a brand new to this is how I'm going to live my life. What they need are practices that take their faith deeper. Prayer habits, service opportunities, Bible study help. And stuff. So maybe that's kind of where you find yourself. I feel like a lot of people in churches in general are probably in this category. Just kind of like, I, I, I love Jesus and I'm kind of basing some things in my life on Jesus, but I need some help going even further and I need to ratchet up my intentionality on growing in my faith. So in a growing faith category, the next stage, those people consistently serve others with their gifts. They're rooted in God's Word. They have a heart for the lost. They have accountability and responsibility to others and to leaders. And becoming like Jesus is their definite goal, for sure. And the, some of the things they need to grow is not just service opportunities, but leadership opportunities. And learning and knowing their spiritual gifts and learning how to pour into and mentor others. So this is kind of that part of your faith where you not only like, do these things and take these things, but you also then start pouring into others. And you want to mentor and help other people grow in their faith. And then finally, the mature faith is the fruit of the Spirit is evident in these people's lives, and they are on mission with Jesus to make disciples. It's not just, yeah, we're a part of a church that does this, and that's cool, but no, that's our mission. I take ownership of that mission, and this is what I am about. I am about making disciples. So all, all of a sudden, like we start to weed out some folks in, in, in this category here, because if every single one of us were really on mission to make disciples, I wonder how many services we'd have. It's a God-centered life versus a, a, a man-centered life. Very much God everything, and they give of themselves. What they need is relationship with people new in the faith or pre-faith. They really need to be pouring into people and opportunities to sharpen their faith and evangelize. So, so you see, there's, there's stages of growth, really, in your discipleship, this life of discipleship. There's a vision. There's a vision. Sometimes we, as churches, have baptized people, said, hey, welcome to the family, awesome, but not giving people a vision for growth or help them understand, like Paul, further down the road, is still straining forward. He's still pressing on to the goal of Christ's likeness. So when you become a disciple, you are now on this journey, this pathway of growing and learning and becoming like Christ. Discipleship is the life of pursuing Christ and becoming like Him. And as you get more mature, you bring other people along with you. You see this as your mission to make disciples as well. And so Paul says, with all that mind, he says, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. So Paul's willing and encouraging people to follow him, to come, I'll show you, learn from me. We can do this together. Again, he's not saying I'm perfect. I've got it figured out. And I think that's a real key for some of us who are scared to mentor or disciple other people is we don't feel like we've arrived. But that's not the indicator of a mature faith. It's more of a heart to bring people along in growth. You don't have to be perfect to help other people know Jesus. Because you're not perfect. And this side of heaven, you're not going to be perfect, right? That's what Paul's saying. That's why I love this. I don't have to use an excuse. It's an encouragement. Oh, I don't have to have all the answers. I don't have to have everything figured out. I can, I can grab someone and say, hey, walk with me. Let's do this life together. He says, on the contrary, uh, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. And I think that Paul's talking about people within the church, which is a scary thought. He says, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is their shame with minds set on earthly things. So again, like we talked about last week, don't use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge the flesh. It's kind of that similar idea. Their God is their belly. They have this overwhelming desire to give in to their senses and their sinful desires and their selfishness and whatever pleases them and feels good physically, emotionally, sexually. That's the idea behind that word shame there. Their minds on earthly things. And again, it's easy to continue on in that life 
if you just are content with associating with Jesus as opposed to being a disciple of Jesus. Because if you're a disciple of Jesus, your life has changed. You're leaving the things in the past in the past and you're pressing forward to pursuing Christ and becoming like Him. And again, the eyes on the prize. Here is the prize, verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. This life of being a disciple is really tough. This is not for the weak of heart. It's easy to want to jump ship at times. This, words like press on and strain and push forward are very appropriate because this is not an easy thing to do to pursue Christ and to become like Him in a world that hates Him and thinks you're an idiot for believing fairy tales and that you're some weak-minded individual who needs Jesus as a crutch to get through. Yeah, I need Jesus as a crutch, all right. I need Jesus as a lifeline. I need Jesus, period, because I can't do this without Him. And I don't care to admit it. And sometimes I crawl on my belly like an earthworm. I don't care. I'm moving forward because I want to be like Jesus because I know what He's done for me. And my hope is in the fact that my citizenship is already there. My citizenship is already in heaven. And I wait for the day that my struggle and my pushing and my pressing and my straining is over with. And I am with Him, resurrected, glorious body. The power that rose Jesus from the grave is at work in me and transforms me. That's what my vision is set on. So I will spend my life pursuing Christ so I can know that reality. That's what discipleship is. It's not a program, it's not a group, it's not a book you read, it's not a lecture you hear. Discipleship is a life of pursuing Christ and becoming like Him. And if you can engage in doing that, at some point along the way, you will go and make disciples. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for today. We thank You for Your grace, Lord. Your grace. that has invited us to be a part of this journey. You've forgiven us of so much. Father, I, we, we thank you. Father, I just pray that you'd keep our, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, the things that are above, not on earthly things, the things that are below. Help us to take one step in front of the other in this life, this journey, this endeavor this marathon of pursuing Jesus Christ and becoming like Him. Father, give us the strength we need every day. And Father, by Your grace, help us to bring other people along on this journey. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.